Welcome back, everybody, to the Cool Times Podcast. I'm your host, Vince Free, joined by the other host, my life and business partner, Jenna Free. What's up, cool people? All right. We are here to talk all things cool about the cold storage construction industry. And today, we have a very, very well-fit guest, a good friend of ours. We're excited about him. This gentleman was born and raised in Portland, Oregon, and he has been in the cold storage construction industry since 2010. He was a territory rep for Arbonne, uh, a high-speed door company out of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, from 99 to 2010. Uh, in fact, this guest of ours, he sat on the right height door cabinet and helped develop uh, the fast track and barrier glider doors, which is uh, still their staple products out there today in the market. If you guys haven't seen it, it's a, it's a great product. Um, and then in uh, 2009, uh, he took a job offer and joined Ice Equip. And Ice Equip, uh, and he was a project and, and sales manager. And Ice Equip was a, a thermal contractor, a low time contractor mm -hmm. doing insulated metal panels. We love having insulated metal panel we people sure on the do. show. And then uh, uh, our guest, he uh, he tripled Ice Equip's revenue from 2010 to 2017 and became vice president of the company. Mm -hmm. uh, this guy's a stud. Uh, I think everyone else knew that. And then Dan Powers at Fisher approached uh, Ice Equip and, and came up with the strategy to uh, make Ice Equip Fisher Thermal Services. And as of today... Uh, our guest is the senior project manager of Fisher Thermal Services, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. John Howell. Woo, John Howell. Wow, that's impressive, guys. I'm actually impressed by, by, by what you said. So <laughs> I want to I want to uh, certainly qualify. The, the tripling of the revenue wasn't just me. Dave Reinhardt is like can sell ice cubes to Eskimos, and he, you know, he was the driving force in that company. But um, it was a good fit for us, uh, and, and we worked well together. And, it was kind of the nature of the industry during that period of time too. Um, uh, just a lot of growth. Projects were bigger, a lot more activity. Panels became much more mainstream in, in a lot of different construction issues. And the nature of our projects changed a lot. You know, our average project when I started was probably, you know, a big project was a half a million dollars. Wow, wow. You know, yeah. and, and we were really relatively small. I remember being one of the, I think I'm, I was the first of us that actually quoted a job that was in excess of a million dollars. And everybody's like, okay, what's that going to look like? Yeah. Yeah. Million dollar panel job is, is I think today is a nice size job, but man, back in when you were doing it, I mean, that's a, that's what a $3 million job today. Probably. Yeah. I mean, just by virtue of price increases and so forth and cost increases, but yeah. So, you know, it was, it, it was good times. I really enjoyed it. Um, Dave's been awesome to work for and work with. Um, mm -hmm. He's an institution in this industry. He comes from, from way back with the Dean Sauls and those, those guys who kind of wrote the book in this business. So, sure, sure. Man, I, we should play a drinking game on the show. Every time the word Dean Saul comes up, we should have to have a drink of tequila. I like it. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I feel like every show we have, his name comes up, man. <laughs> yeah, you know, it kind of goes without saying. Guys are He's a player and he always has been, and he's an outstanding individual. So, yeah, absolutely. Yes, we, we don't disagree at all. Totally. Yeah. So, so thanks, for the, thanks for bringing me in, guys. Yeah, thanks yeah. For well, joining us. Yeah, thank you for joining us. Um, I, I want to talk about your story, and, and Jenna's going to help me with that your beginning, mm -hmm. uh, how you entered the industry, because it was a lot like mine and selling doors. And, yep. you know, you went from selling doors, man. You're, you know, you climbed the top of the mountain, baby. <laughs> we were commonly referred to as doorknobs oh no were you no one ever called me that Not your face. <laughs> you, you i just, was just referred to as a knob <laughs> yeah yeah um yeah a lot of similarities that's i started as a, actually when i went on board when i got hired by Arbon, i had spent time as um in the portland area working for a mechanical contract for some of the um, I came out of college as a political science major with kind of some emphasis on free law and took my LSATs, thought I was going to go to law school and probably would have been a pretty good attorney, but I didn't, wasn't, I don't know, just didn't seem like the fit for me. Yeah. So then I took a year and just hid and didn't try to avoid joining the real world, lived on a farm, a five acre place up in Coburg, North of Eugene with a couple of buddies and um, Basically, just partied a lot, you know, yeah. and then finally decided, 
it was time to go out and, and, and try and make something and such. So yeah, a lot of things that contribute to where I ended up, but some of which were learning trade. I worked in x-ray equipment, um, x-ray processing equipment for a lot of years. So I had a decent mechanical aptitude. Uh, ended up from there, decided I really wanted to get out and be, do something a little more professional. I was recruited by New York Life Insurance to sell to sell life insurance. That's something. And, and I learned a lot about sales. You know, and then I couldn't make a living doing that. Then got recruited by another company called R Squared Scan Systems, who was focused on um, radiology equipment, imaging equipment, but not so much on the processing side, computerized imaging equipment. And I had a lot of territory knowledge and client knowledge, so they brought me on, and that was a blast. I spent three years covering San Francisco, Portland, and Seattle, and had my run of the whole. You know, I could I'd spend a week in San Francisco, a week in Seattle, and then two weeks in Portland visiting hospitals and selling preventive light screens on, on CT scanners. So, you know, it's just the, the, the culmination of life experiences that puts us where we are. And then I ended up with our one. Totally. Mm -hmm. And had a really good run there. Really enjoyed the company. Right had some outstanding organization. They're a, they're a ginormous company today. I mean, they offer they all kinds of doors. I mean, they're talking... You got fans, you got, you know, the, you know, the big, the, the big ass fans, but that's not a big oh, yeah. ass fan. That's another company, but they got right. dock equipment, high speed doors. I mean, they, they got everything. Yeah. They, they're, um, the foundation of the company was a company called, they, they call themselves American Dock Bridge. They started out with dock levelers, but their real, uh, the, the thing that their big innovation was, was restraints. They literally invented trailer restraints. R restraints for trailers? Dock, dock trucks. Levelers. The dot yeah. clocks. Yep. Yep. That so the, the folks out there listening, you know, uh, in these big cold storage warehouses, when the semis back up to the, to the dock door, there's this big metal, you know, I guess, bumper, if you will, on the back of a semi. Right. And as it hits that, um, this arm comes up and it locks into that. And as a yep. safety factor, it prevents the truck from driving away when there's, you know, people driving forklifts, uh, full of food and pallet and cold storage stuff onto these food trucks right? In and out. So it prevents, it's a safety thing, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was, a, it was a huge innovation in the industry, huge safety innovation. Yep. And so they wrote the book, The Evolution of That Product is pretty fascinating. Um, but it wasn't my favorite thing to sell. I mean, I, when I started, when I got into the industry, doors are just a far sexier product than dock lock or dock lock. Dock lock was a piece of steel. You know? It's like, man. Yeah. How yeah. thick is your steel? <laughs> yeah. It's like, man, what's your, what's your, what's your beam design? I mean, it was like, oh, God, I got so tired of telling that story, but <laughs> into the doors because it was fun to show them, you know, they're fast. They're, it was a really great story to tell. There's a lot of safety features that the right height had in, uh, incorporated in the products. So that's where it all started. And just by virtue of the fact that I'm selling high speed doors, the prim primary clientele was controlled environment. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, I mean, you know, speaking of, of right height and just talking about you being on the board and, uh, and, and going through the design innovation of the fast track and the fast track is a high speed roll up door that's insulated. And we had some other people on the show that, um, uh, have similar products to that. And, and I remember when I was selling for my other door, I mean, we were competitors, John. I mean, I was yeah, literally I covering the West the Northwest selling against you. And, and, and I'm a young buck, uh, 2006, uh, out of college in 05. And, you know, don't know, don't know Jack about ish. And I'm, I'm, I'm a going up against a professional salesman who is selling a badass product. And I think I landed maybe one out of 30 against you, <laughs> but it was such an awesome product. Cause we didn't have a product like that. The right. fast track was such an innovative product. Cause it was moving at over hundred inches a second. The curtain's insulated, right? So I, you know, I'm still selling a hard panel door that's not moving nearly as fast at the time. And it's just, man, that product was innovative. Walk us through a little bit how how that product came came to fruition, right, from start to finish. Well, I mean, the high speed door industry really was kind of uh, all the new doors was one of the first high speed doors in the continent in the United States. But mm -hmm. most all of that technology came from Europe, so everybody's kind of pirating and bringing in and buying technology. The right height's big deal to begin with. Uh, their, their feature was safety and it was a soft bottom reach. So mm -hmm. they had a product called the Protecto for years. And we sold against uh, the hard bottom edge doors 
And it was really a safety sail. It's like you can stand underneath it, you can drive it across your shoulder, more maintenance friendly, they take a hit better, you don't bend the bottom bar. So that, that product had been in for a long time. It was kind of the, the foundation of the high speed door. Yeah. And, and then it just came to the time where it was getting tired, it was becoming obsolete, kind of a little maintenance intensive, the technology was aging. So they just decided to revamp the whole lineup. And um, I mean, the, the engineering team at Wright Height. So there's, it was myself, a couple other regional guys from Wright Height, and a couple guys from Independence, and um, the vice president of the Dorda region. And we just kind of met periodically and bounced ideas and started talking about how we were going to do this drive system, and what it would look like. And again, none of this, a lot of this technology is not. They call it proprietary, but it's kind of a hybrid of other people's ideas. Like in, right? just like, well, we take these ideas and we put them together. But the big deal was impactability and speed. You know, when back early on in, in um, my career with Armand, was, I started talking to Cascade Energy Engineering up there about energy analysis to show return on investment on the storage. Right? And we had our own little worksheet. Our engineers had worked out a worksheet to plug and play. And we could tell I could go in one of my sales. Tools was I could go and say, okay, look how many using the door this frequently, here's your temperature deltas, I could plug these values in. And then it would calculate a return on investment based on energy consumption, reduced energy consumption yep. against the cost of the door. So that was something that we used ourselves. There was there was some of the premises were a little suspect, which I was called out on by a couple of clients. You know. <laughs> I would start talking to Cascade Energy about them focusing on door openers because they would do, I don't know if you know who Cascade Energy is. I, I do know Cascade Energy. Um, yeah. They're, they're a big energy company out in the Northwest, right? Correct. Yeah. And they started, we actually started in Walla Walla, a guy named Marcus Wilcox, but they were really small when I started talking to them. And it was like, because they do building envelopes and their idea was to do, facilitate incentives from communities mm-hmm. for energy effective uh, upgrades. And so they did all kinds of prescriptive stuff for lighting and for other things that were just kind of plug and play formulas. Well, they didn't really have anything for doors. And I got kind of like, you know, we should start thinking about these door openings in cold facilities and just isolate, you know, identifying that as a standalone, prescriptive, easy to turn around offer from an energy standpoint. And I was pinging them for a long time. Um, and they finally came up with something. And I, I wasn't, you know, I mean, I wasn't total genesis for that, but I was knocking on their door a lot. And it's become very common to be able to go to the Emma Energy 360 or any of these other facilitators and take it to your client and say, um, you know, here, here's what we can do. Your local energy PUD is offering some incentives. They can pay for X percent of this project. So that was a big part of um, my success in, in the Northwest was just kind of utilizing those tools. It also helped that a lot of my competitors, you know, the right techs of the world and all these weren't really spending much time in the Northwest. So they didn't really have, they weren't focusing much energy. And the hard panel doors was not, no offense, Vince, you are awesome, but it wasn't hard to sell against a hard panel door because if you got hit once, it was like, you know. Yeah, but, yeah, I know, I know, I know. I No, it's awesome. I, but I remember, you know, I say this a lot about you. One of the things I respected right away about you was the first time you called on me. And this is when you were at Ice Equip, I think. This when I was Ice Equip, yeah. Because then I was selling to you. <laughs> you were selling to me, right. And yeah. it was awesome. And I mean, I'd have other door reps, the right tech guys, and all the guys come in. Obviously, you knew more about your competitors than anybody that has ever called up. And I thought that was super impressive because you could speak to what you were selling and it's better than anybody. Instead of just blah, 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 telling stories about how great your product was, you knew pitch. You know, industry knowledge and had a lot of respect for what you're working up against. But so I was, you know, I'll pay you a compliment there. Um, well, thank you. Um, I appreciate it. And that was just some of the training from Chuck Zimmerman when I was at ASI. And that was one of a big thing that Chuck every day said, listen, you better know more about your competition than do your own product. Yeah. And that's just we needed to know what was going on, especially for working so young, um, looking so young, walking into a, you know, uh a senior engineer's office of a facility and trying to sell them a product and talk about VFDs and, um, you know, reversing edges and just, you know, servo motors and all these things that, that you're trying to use to sell. And, 
and one small move and those engineers will chew you up. <laughs> oh, bad. Yeah. I believe in been there. Yeah. So you, you talk a lot about energy and I, I feel like I'm Jenna's still here. I know. That's I okay. <laughs> you go. I know you, you have a lot of questions. You have a lot go. of questions to ask John, but I, I want to stay on this topic of Absolutely. energy and selling and uh, using energy to sell a product really big out in the Northwest at that time too, is the HDR air door product. Right. right. And uh, oftentimes I would come up against that product too. And, and man, we'd be like, eh, it consumes a lot of energy to run those fans 24 seven. And you're leaving your opening wide open, even though they say it's 60 to 70% sealed all the time. If you add up the life of the cycle of the door going up and down, up and down, the door is open majority of the time. So having a constant 70% uh, seal efficiency with the air door actually makes more sense. It gets rid of frost ice. Did, did you sell against the air door concept or did you try to, uh, team up with the air door concept and put your right height doors with them? A little bit of both. I started selling against them. Um, and I, again, I was guilty of not knowing enough about it. I could, I could speak just enough to be dangerous about it, but I would make that argument. So it's just been home and I'm just blown there. You know? and, and honestly, I have a lot more respect for that product now than I ever had yeah. at the time um, because I was trying to sell it against it, right? <laughs> then I, and, and, and there was a huge cost cut to it too because early on those doors were astronomically expensive, which is, that's changing it too. They're much more competitive, um, more, more market competitive with other types of products. Sure. But it was a point where I realized that I'd seen those doors with high-speed vertical acting doors mounted on them to kind of double up that. So yeah. there was a time when yeah, I tried to piggyback on that. I'm like, well, yeah, if you're going to door and you have an HCR door, then it might be worth considering putting another barrier on there to carry sure. back to that. To that. Sure. It wasn't a huge threat to what I was doing at the time. We weren't a lot of people spending that kind of money on those doors. And I saw a lot of those doors go in, and then five or six years later, them torn out, just go crash. So, mm -hmm. I think we're going to open this quite a bit in our projects. I think those are pretty valid. I like those a lot. Yeah. It, and, and it's interesting the, you know, the timeline here of, of how that all went down. And when I was calling an ice equipped and, and I didn't have to sell against you anymore, thank God. And, and so I'm calling on you and, and I meet Dave and you guys are super sharp. You got this cool little warehouse office uh, out in Vancouver, Washington, and and Ice Equips a uh, it's a it's a badass panel company, and you guys yeah. are doing a ton of work, and you guys are good at it. And it's and uh, and then um, I, I got out of the door industry, and you became my competitor again. <laughs> <laughs> and I was you know, and I'm I'm selling panel jobs against you, and and we're we're kind of both fighting over the same customer up there in the Northwest with Fisher and. Um, I guess instead of getting into all that, let's talk a little bit about, um, let's talk about ice equip going into Fisher and, and, and where you're at with that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's an exciting thing that happened and we'd love to hear more about it. So when I started with ice equip, um, I have been around for a long time and, and the genesis of actually was, I don't know if you know, Stuart Asberg, his father, who was the founder of ice equip actually. And there was ISO Lock early on. He, he made panels. And then they turned into being a contractor and he brought Dave on board. This was, you know, a zillion years ago. Um, when I, I came- I did not know that, by the way. ISO Lock and you guys were making yeah. panels? Yeah, we weren't, but Randy's, or uh, Stuart's dad was. That's what, uh, Stuart grew up sweeping the EPS dust off the warehouse floor after the panels together all day. Seriously. Yeah. yeah. You know, he's a homer. He's in the industry for life. He didn't have any choice. Yeah, there's yeah. a lot. There's a lot that happened within, I guess, almost a short period of time, you know? Relatively, yeah. So there, I think that when I started with ISO Clip, um, ISO Clip and Fisher had become a little estranged because I think Randy and Jerome had a little pissing contest at one point. There wasn't a lot going on there. And I started we don't know who Randy or Jerome are. So who are those? Randy guys? Asbury, who was the owner of ISO Clip at the time, and Jerome, who was, uh, who was the president of Fisher. For Got family. you. Family. Okay. So I think they had a little bit of a um, falling out. And I don't think we'd done a lot of work for them. So my first job with Fisher was, um, I don't remember, it was like a small job up in, way up in the boonies, a little process job. And I got my ass handed to me on that job. I had it so bad and I was under the bus immediately. We got it done. 
And then I did another job, a, a juice processing job for fish and got my ass handed to me on that one. <laughs> At that point, I'm figuring there was no way, you know. And got, what Dave, he's like, just let me and live through it and just, you know, presumably learn something from it. Mm -hmm. And Fisher was great to me on this. I mean, they, they helped make us whole um, because we performed well. We did really good work, but I just didn't have a handle on, on the rest of the inside. So I continued to kind of nurture this relationship with Fisher. Um, and we started doing more work for them and, and uh, quite a lot more. And they became a significant part of our business, you know. And Dan, I know, had been noodling with the idea of self-performing work. He likes, part of our business model at Fisher is self-performing as many steps as we can. And that's really kind of, I think, been a combined brainchild of the, of the executive management at Fisher, which really Dan's been passionate about that for a long time. So he started talking to us about that, you know, 2000, early 2017 about, hey, you know, I really want to do this. What would that look like? Went back and forth and back and forth. And by October of 2017, um, the end of their fiscal year is when we decided, started this transition. You know, and so it was a gradual acquisition of our assets and bringing us on incrementally. And Dave had a lot of work that was still in the way that he had to finish. So I went online first, myself and Stuart, and I, one, of our, one or two of our foremen uh, and half of our crew all went to Fisher. Um, and, you, you know, it was kind of rough and tumble to begin with because they're like, okay, here you go. Here's the pricing model. Go build shit. I was like, wow. <laughs> all right. <laughs> yeah. um, so, you know, the, we, it's been, an, it, it's just been a great, great process. It took a year and a, another year or so for Dave to wrap up his outstanding projects and come on board. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, we've learned a lot. Everybody has a better understanding. It was interesting when we first came on board because some of the PMs would come to me and say, like, I need a bid on this. And like, it's not really how our internal pricing strategy works, right? So then it's been an ongoing process. I think mean, everybody's much more comfortable with it. They're kind of uh, our, the quality of our work. And as you said, one of Isoclip's, I mean, we were really proud of the quality of our future product. Sure. Uh, we never walk away from the problem. Not a couple of those jobs, but we yeah, just, yeah, yeah. So Fisher, so so for the listeners to understand, so so Fisher is a design build uh, general contractor out of the out of the Northwest. They're actually Fisher just doesn't do cold storage construction. They're actually a big company that does a lot of other things too. Correct? Yeah, we got our fingers in a lot of different things. I'd say a part of our of our book of our portfolio is food processing and cold storage. Okay, our design expertise is largely there. But we are on design build. Um, we've got architects, structural engineers, civil engineers on staff, MEP. Um, so we're self-performing and designing a lot of that. So our ideal situation is to do a brief like get with a client, uh, design a building around their needs with our knowledge and their requirements, and have them entrust the entire project to us, knowing that they're going to get the best finished product. And we have we get to exert more control over the process. Uh, than we do with subcontractors. And um, yeah, it's been a really, really, really good form. I mean, the business model is, is outstanding. And, uh, you know, that's really Dan's big job. It's, it's uh, you know, a really, really deep talent pool. Actually. When I first came on board, a lot of young, talented, smart people, mm -hmm. a little bit intimidating. I know. So, I know, know the team. It's a good team. Yeah. You know this. Really, really yeah. sharp group of people. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Let me ask you, John, because you've been in the industry from doors to thermal side. Now you're you're still there. Throughout that time in cold storage, are there some cool moments that stand out, like cool stories that stick out in your mind, maybe from a project, maybe from a relationship that you'd want, be willing to share with us? Lots of, lot, I mean, a lot. <laughs> a lot. Funny stories yeah. count too. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm not really very, I, I think I'm more funny when I'm spontaneous. I'm not, I'm not a very good storyteller. Or think. drinking wine. Or drinking wine. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we have a lot I of fun when we drink the wine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is true, yeah. Um, you know, I, one of, probably one of the things that sticks out to in my memory is uh, I was working on a project up in 
it actually goes back to that first million dollar job that I did. That job never went anywhere. They never built the building. I, I established some dialogue with the project manager at the time. And he was telling me the story about, hey, have you heard about this project, the, the giant fridge? I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? He goes, no, there's a website. There's a link. Go check it out. And I hit the link, and it was basically footage of um, a new cold property in Europe Drive along was a German project, and there was just this giant monolithic white box, right? Yeah. We know, we know what those are now, right? Mm-hmm. Well, at the time, it's like, really? So I was kind of chasing that. And Dave and I got a call from um, a company, a European construction company called Be Built, a Dutch company. And we met with an architect in Tri Cities, and they were, it was really the, the idea of the first new coal project that they were going to do. Didn't turn into a new coal project, turned into preferred freezer in Richmond. This is meeting with this Dutch company and talking about how they do things versus how American construction standards occur. It was a real interesting conversation. And there's a lot of, no, that's not how we do it. And like, well, no, that's not how we do it. <laughs> I had oak blocks for isolation blocks and the columns instead of, you know, high density polyurethane. So, that was that was yeah. you know, gave me some kind of vision into what the future of these cold storage facilities would be looking like. Going mm-hmm. well, from boxes and boxes to two hundred fifty thousand square feet of a minus ten freezer, yeah. kind of hard thing to imagine at the time. Now it seems normal. Yeah, that That's is true. that is a crazy moment, and I. I learned about that moment when I think maybe we had Josh Curry up on stage at, at one of the SIBA events talking about a new cold project and, and um, the European design versus made in America or American design. It's like, it's different and they do mm-hmm. things different. And we could have another hour on this podcast talking about the, the engineering and design differences between how the Europeans like to build it and how we like to build it. So yes. speaking of innovation, speaking of where, what you see and where we're going, what, give us, uh, give us your crystal ball of, uh, where do you think the industry is going from a technology standpoint or innovation? I don't know what else to, to say about insulated metal panels, the technology itself. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's pretty tried and true. It's so efficient, right? Mm-hmm. Actually, um, dependable. Mm-hmm. And- Certainly going from the old EPS days to this funnel place fully appeared uh, type of product. So I don't, I, it, I don't know. I don't really have much of a crystal ball um, on that. I think that the products that we're seeing are pretty highly evolved, you know? You, can, you know? Uh, you think that today though, John, you think about it. Like look at doors for a second, <laughs> right? True. Right. Look at doors. And, and, and before we had those like big plastic clear uh, by folding doors with the heat lamps. And we thought those were cool because they were kind of fast. You could see through them, but it, it would cost you about, you know, $300,000 a day in electricity to run them. <laughs> raw stuff. But, Pretty close. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it was an exterior toaster, right. <laughs> you know? Um, and then, you know, going from the high speed sliding doors to the high speed fabric doors and then air mm-hmm. doors and everything that, so like today we sit here and we think, man, I don't know what else can happen. Right. The technology, but something's going to happen. Something's yeah. going to innovate. Look at panels. I mean, panels went from, gosh, you know, the styrene to urethane. And now all of a sudden, you know, we have higher R value with thinner panels and better yeah. foam. So, I mean, I could see if you were going to ask me, I could see there's going to be a chemical or a foam makeup or compound that is going to provide twice the R value at twice as less weight, maybe. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you don't know. I mean, uh, no one knows, but it's it's going to happen. It has to happen. Yeah. You know, there's so many environmental things that are impacting the painting manufacturers now, too, with building agents. And, and it's kind of a dual force type of a deal. But yeah, it could well be. I think, you know, what I'd really love to see, and I only know one person who's really taken the testing very far, is uh, get rid of mineral fiber. For, I'd love to see a US rated, ASTM rated urethane panel. Yes. Work with a more affordable. Um, yes. Mineral, I don't know about you, but mineral fiber is the bane of my existence right now. <laughs> and the mineral and fiber is the interior compound in a insulated metal panel or metal panel 
And that's, you know, that's your fire rated uh, panel, right? Fire rated panels, right. It's raw. So, um, yeah. And I know one individual who took that testing as far as they could possibly take it had, I think he was saying 12 or 20 thermocouple testings and one of them failed at 58 minutes. And the whole thing went down the tubes. That's insane. Yeah. So they're looking for a one hour rating and they're going to use an eight inch panel and one out of 20 thermocouples that they tested failed and the whole thing was off and they're like, how much money, how much are we going to spend on this? But I could see that happen. Somebody's going to pick it up again. Kingspan started a lot of years ago and he kind of gave up for the same reason. You know, I'd like to see that happen. But yeah, I think you're right. I think, you know, thinner, more efficient could be in our future. Probably not. Well, I'm still working in this. Business. Young guy like you, John, come on, man. We got many more years. <laughs> Dude, I'm like 110. I'm ready. I'm good. <laughs> keeps you excited, I guess. What's something exciting that's happening with Fisher Thermal Services or Fisher as a general contractor that keeps you there, keeps you showing up every day? Uh, the thing about Fisher that keeps me going is the culture here. I, you know, it, the company culture is really strong. Uh, leadership is, is um, very solid, really accessible, very human. All of the projects we're working on are very exciting and interesting. And again, they're growing. We're, we're branching out. We're, you know, our, our, our sweet spot's always been west of the Rockies, but we're working in Indianapolis now. We're looking at projects in your neck of the woods. We're looking at stuff all over the country. So, mm -hmm. um, and, and for me, being able to be involved in the front end and being actually um, utilized as in a consulting mm -hmm. Form, you know, in the consulting capacity in some of these, uh, in some of the design, that's really super rewarding. Because, you know, the door thing comes in. I do door reviews with the clients and with our design team, the whole layout, our values, what we know, everything that we know comes to the table. We talk about a lot of different parts of that. So, um, yeah, I think Fisher is a really, I just, it's an outstanding company. The capacity of the company is huge, a lot of capabilities. The continued, movement towards trying to control and manage more of our own scopes. Um, mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. That's another, that's a, that's another question I had for you guys. So Fisher, uh, to my knowledge, I didn't know you guys self-performed anything. Um, uh, and, and now I know you guys are self-performing uh, your instrumental panels uh, mm -hmm. most of the time um, with your thermal division. Is there anything else you guys are self-performing right now? Civil, we do our own dirt work. Okay. Uh, Concrete, and we're doing MEP equipment layout, engineering, um, provide and install, um, roofing. So, we wow. hired a roofing company. So, wow. we have Juan developed, uh, uh, yeah, all surface roof is now Fisher Roofing Services. Did you guys acquire them? We did. Awesome. Yeah. Kidwell is now on our team. So, we're trying to. That would have been something exciting you could have brought up when Jenna <laughs> asked you. You know, I just don't think that quick. You know, we got there. Don't you know, worry, we got there. Yeah, yeah we got gotta, there, John. You don't lead me down. You know, you got to lead me to the water. <laughs> well, let me yeah, lead you to this exciting. one here. Why? Why? Why would one? Why would one buy from Fisher? All the reasons we just talked about. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of value to have all of that in one package. Exactly. Transparency. Um, you know, it's full disclosure. We do a lot of cost plus. Uh, business models, and uh, we have we engage the client. We're able to control every element of the, of the design from, yeah. from the ground up, and we're, and we're cost dependent. Like I said, full transparency in these cases. We're just like here it is. This is this is what's going to cost. This is what we're costing you. How we're doing it, and I think they, I think our clients feel like they can trust us, but they also earn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, and where can people find you guys at trade shows? Uh, what trade shows are you guys going to right now? You know, I only go, I don't go a lot. Um, what about Fisher? Fisher, I have to, you know, the construction, I'm not certain. I think they went to um, the, the refrigeration room. And then I don't know if we go to packaging. Mm -hmm. You know, you got Pack Expo. There was a big poultry show recently uh, out in Atlanta. Um, 
you know, there's a bunch of them food processing trade shows. Um, yeah. uh, I got to ask you, what is your favorite show? Well, there's only one answer to that. So there's only one right answer to that. It's SIBA, of course. <laughs> you know, with our engagement, I've been engaged with SIBA since, you know, since I started the industry. Um, yeah. I accept the nobody to pronounce that. Um, and, you know, you went through a nice run of leadership there. And, 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 and thank you for that. I've been involved thank in you. work, um, some behind the scenes stuff with, uh, with GCCA trying to develop a, a certification. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we're looking, we're working on more or less a, a, a training model for controlled environment building professionals. Yes. Whether it's design, project management, um, yep. so over different homes. So that's been fun to be involved with. And we've really been able to work with some outstanding folks from around the country on that. I was flattered to be involved in it. I'm not sure they picked me, but I hope I brought something to the table. I think you bring a lot to the I table, and, and and I know about the that kind of like a breakout, um, like not a breakout meeting, but you guys have your own little committee. breakout committee um, yeah. that's handling that piece, and and we got great leadership now. Marco Jelovich, uh, he's our our new chairman of of SIBA, and he's doing a great job, and and he's really spearheading. Uh, all of these committees and making sure that they're going forward. And I know what the one you're on, um, I'll be involved in uh, with Sam Tittman. And there's some exciting things about that because, you know, we as, as professional cold storage builders, we really, um, we don't love going up against people that don't build these specialty buildings and uh, having some type of certification where, you know, you can look in a book and, and if you are SEBA stamp, you are SEBA certified, you know, these guys know, these guys know cold, these guys know thermal envelope, um, you know, food process, USDA, all, all these things. Uh, I think we're really looking for that and, and to add value to the end user. So the end users know who to, Hey, here's a book of professionals. These guys. Trust. Yeah. 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 So, so that's, that's really where we want to take it. It's a big deal. We're working with Marco, you know, Marco, Brian King, Charles Woolley. Mm-hmm team that was on this group, I said, I, I was in the steam company there and I felt proud to be a part of it. The facilitator, Jeff from GCSCA was fabulous too. He really knew how to, um, how to bring all these things together. And, and it, it was a, it was a hell of an interesting process. It really was. Yeah. Hope it continues to turn this Well, John, can you tell our listeners if they want to learn more about Fisher or Fisher Thermal Services, where can they look for that information? Um, Google Fisher Construction, you know, fishercg.com. Um, our website's very, very... What's uh, your website? www.fishercgi.com. I told you. you fishercgi.com. <laughs> there you go. You had it. That's, that's if you just awesome. see Fisher Construction, it's, that's, it'll take you there. I know. <laughs> we got there. We got there. So, so Johnny, we uh, I want to be uh, uh, respectful of your time. Uh, we're getting to wrap this thing up here. But final round... Uh, we call the cool rapid round questions brought to you by freeze construction. We are going to, we're going to ask you this or that questions real quick and you are going to give us your answers. Okay. Okay. It's fun. Here we go. All right. Uh, box and box or ground up project. Oh boy. Ground up. Okay. Ammonia or free on refrigeration. I don't really have an opinion there. I think my understanding has a lot to do with the, size and application of the project. So okay. Okay. Beach side or pool I'm side? On, I'm big on I'm big on CO2 though. CO2 is okay. Yeah. I'll add that in later on in later one. episodes. So yeah. uh beach side or pool side? I'm a pool side guy. West coast or east coast? West coast. <laughs> Are you Netflix or YouTube? Netflix. iOS or Android? iOS. Work hard or play hard? Both. Mm-hmm. Pepsi or Coke? Coke. Toilet paper over or under? Over. Thank you. <laughs> Beer or wine? Wine. Yeah. Dine in or delivery? Oh, dine in. Okay. Last but not least, Justin Timberlake or Justin Bieber? Oh, Timberlake. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> 
I love it, John. Dude, you're a stud. Thank you so much for being on the show. For all our listeners out there, you guys can find the Cool Times Podcast at cooltimespodcast.com. Uh, all major social medias, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram. Uh, those links will have little 30 to 60 second clips of our videos. And then you guys can listen to the full episodes on Apple, I, uh, not iTunes, but Apple Podcasts. And YouTube, you guys can Google Cool Times Podcast. Hit that red button, subscribe, give us reviews. Uh, thank you guys so much for listening. John, thank you so much, my man. So we appreciate you. having you. Can't wait. Thanks for having me, guys. It's been fun. Love you guys. I right, love you too, big dog. I'll see you and talk to you soon. Okay, bud.